Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are honored to be sitting down with Mel Shapcott. She is an artist, an abstract artist who has launched NFTs recently. We're going to talk about art and NFTs, I guess. So thank you so much, Mel, for joining us today. My pleasure. So as an artist, when you first stumbled upon the idea of NFTs, what did you think about it? Well, I, the first time, I, it was before I heard of NFTs, but I'd heard about putting your art on the blockchain. So that is NFT, but I didn't even know the word back then. And I was pretty excited about it. It seemed pretty uh, interesting, but like far-fetched, kind of like, how would I ever do that? Like, <laughs> how am I ever going to figure that out? So um, it was a few years that passed uh, before I really got into NFTs and when I read the news article, I think it was about people and NFTs were coming in the news and I was just super ignited. I was like, I have to do this. And I just, I hit it full speed. Okay. So full speed, that's important. I think we've seen some big companies like pivot, like right away into this space and do very well. Gary Vaynerchuk comes to mind, V friends. He essentially pivoted much of his time into this project right away. He was real nimble. He also didn't go half in. He committed himself and his organization to it and it paid dividends. So can you, can you speak to like what it means when you moved into this full speed? What were the first steps? And you know what? I want to talk about this, like from a perspective for artists too, like, cause there's artists who I'm sure are thinking about doing this and they just don't know where to begin. Yeah, that was definitely me. Um, I didn't know where to begin. And I just started to Google and read news articles and, you know, like, what is a marketplace? And it eventually, uh, Rarible had got some news coverage at that time. So I just, I went straight to Rarible and uh, was like ready to mint my first piece when I learned about gas fees. <laughs> and then, you know, so that was like kind of the first, uh, first kind of like stall. Um, and then I just, I grabbed a wallet. Again, there was some like some positive press around the rainbow wallet. So I had a rainbow wallet and I went to Rarible and I was like, I'm going to make NFTs. And that is really when my education began because um, it just wasn't quite that simple. Um, and from there, I wound up learning about the NFT community on Twitter, which I had no idea about. And so that was pretty fortunate uh, to be included and get on board with NFT Twitter. Um, and I think, you know, from there, full speed looked more like just starting to talk to people and, um, you know, message people, respond on posts. And I thought, well, what would I do um, in the real world, like as an artist? Like, what would my next step be? And my first step would be to get a show. And so I just started looking for metaverse shows. And uh, from there, people started to give me advice on, on what to do. And yeah, and so now, you know, it didn't take me long. You just start applying for marketplaces. And next thing you know, you're not just on OpenSea, but you're on Foundation and Maker's Place and all the other platforms as well. So you mentioned gas fees. For those who don't know, gas fees are essentially the Ethereum, the, eth the Ether that you pay when you're doing operations on the Ethereum network. So for instance, creating or minting smart contracts and they, you have to pay. And this has been a topic on the Ethereum blockchain for a while now. Sometimes these gas fees, especially in the context of NTV, NFTs have really risen. So you, you pay your gas fees. How does wearable work for those who maybe want to go to it right now and start jumping right in? Sure. I mean, and I'm going to be honest, I actually haven't minted on Rarible uh, since last March. So I quickly moved on from there. That wasn't like the place where I found my home. Um, and, uh, you know, that was a process. So there's different processes. So um, with your on OpenSea, that's like a really easy place to get started. Like there's no upfront gas fees. And in fact, as an artist, there's no gas fees at all. And so that is the route that I wound up going and the route that I you know, suggest to beginners. Um, however, on Rarible, which is where I did start, you pay a fee uh, right up front to mint. And um, the difference is, is OpenSea is lazy minting. So your work is not actually being put on the blockchain, but you actually don't have to pay the fees. And when the work is sold, then it goes on the blockchain and the collector pays the fees. So with Rarible as an artist, 
um, right up front before you, or at the time when you want to mint your first NFT, you pay the gas fee straight up front before you even mint. And then from there, you would go on to listing it, which means to put a sale price on it. And that would also require a gas fee, transaction fee. And so, as we mentioned, these fees used to be very nominal, but with the congestion on the Ethereum marketplace, those fees have really been driven up. And so it could cost a hundred dollars to to pay the transaction fees to mint an NFT these days. So you upload your work to OpenSea and then it appears on the marketplace, correct? Mm -hmm. And that's when you started to message people, look for metaverse shows, I imagine, and uh, correct? Yeah, yeah. So you get your artwork onto OpenSea. And like I said, there's no gas fees there. So it's, it's really simple, like, um, <clears throat> like just like making a post somewhere, like on a social media platform. It's as simple as uploading your artwork, putting in your description, and you hit publish. And again, you're going to have the option to uh, how you're going to list it. So you can list it at a buy now price, and your price is going to be in Ethereum. So you'll say how many Ethereum you would like to sell your artwork for, or you can do an auction. And so I think for beginners and even me, pref uh, even me, like all this time, I still prefer to do buy nows. I don't really like the auction process, but it works for some people. So you just got to feel it out. And so from there, yeah, your, your artwork is up and then you can start to um, connect with people and say, hey, where can I show this work? Or, you know, uh, look for Twitter spaces where you can talk or, you know, like this interviews where you can talk with people and just kind of get the word out there. Where did you find the most success in getting the word out there? Where did you find the NFT community? Well, I mean, I found the NFT community on Twitter. So that was like a complete and total surprise for me, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to discover that there was this whole community there. And that definitely, um, that definitely is what got me started. So I, after my first NFTs on Rarible, I went to the Tezos community. So that's a different blockchain, a different set of marketplaces, a different set of artists, and even a different set of collectors. And there is some overlap, but for me, Tezos was a really friendly place to get started. The gas fees are, you know, again, it's a place where the gas fees are nominal. Um, they're also um, <clears throat> tout the fact that they're a clean NFT. So they're not using the same amount of energy consumption and therefore they're cheaper than the Ethereum gas fees. Um, so I highly recommend Tezos and even some of the other blockchains in terms of uh, finding different communities. Let's see, so Tezos, I, I see they've been marketing their, NF, their platform for NFTs in like big stadiums. They had a big advertisement at City Field. I think I was watching a baseball playoff game or something, it was on the, in the background and I saw a big old Tezos uh, banner under the scoreboard. So, and I believe it said something about NFTs. Now, can you speak to Tezos a little bit more? What's it like minting NFTs on Tezos and how is that community the same or different from some of the other ones? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is, it, I mean, they're each distinct in their own way. They each have their own personality. So minting on Tezos, again, the same, the process is similar. You, you make your, your mint, which is, like I said, as simple as making like a post, you upload your image, you put in your description, you set, um, well, you mint it, and then you go through the process of listing it and set your price. So it's the same process. It's just a different marketplace. So you would go to a different web address to do this and connect. Um, you can use Hicket Nunk or you can use object.com. Those are two different marketplaces. Um, I would say like this is kind of, Tezos is kind of like the art underground, like in my opinion, my estimation. So you get a lot of like just raw art, like art for art's sake. Uh, there's not a lot of like errors or elitism. It's very accessible to uh, people that are just starting as well as, you know, as well as people that really just want to focus on, you know, uh, innovation, like what, how am I pushing my skills? So I, I find it to be like really inspiring place to like look for art and to be involved um, within, within a community. However, you are looking at the difference between the amount that a Tezos coin costs, which I can't tell you what it is today because it's probably slid pretty far, but it's usually around three to $5. For, for, for a Tezos, whereas Ethereum we know is uh, generally been around 3,000. 
recently. So you have a difference in your amount of payout and also the amount that you pay. So even though I don't think that the prices on Ethereum, sorry, on Tezos come anywhere close to the prices of transactions on Ethereum in US dollar value. So I think it's like one of the major differences. And then tell us about, what is it called? NFT Twitter? Yeah, that's just a, that's just a, um, uh, just a, a signed name. It's not anything official. So NFT Twitter is just like the the corner of Twitter that uh, the Twitter or the NFT community carved out for themselves. It uh, grew organically, and so it already existed, you know, before I discovered it. And people are already talking about NFT Twitter and NFT community. And um, last year, the beginning of last year, when I did join Twitter, they still weren't showing full sized images. Like they were doing little crops of of the images and you had all these artists nft artists on there putting this amazing artwork on and twitter was just showing this little sliver of artwork and so um, shortly after i got onto the twitter platform i that changed and they started you know showing the full image and uh, nft twitter pretty much kind of was like yeah that was us you know they're making space for us they're kind of catering to us and even now today um, the news just came out that twitter is allowing you to link your nft into your profile pic and, you know, I imagine that there'll be more innovations coming, which are centered around NFT Twitter. <laughs> so what does that even mean, linking your uh, NFT to your Twitter pick? Sure. I've just only started reading about it today. So, um, and at first it seems simple, but then there's a little bit more to it. Um, basically, the a lot of the social media platforms today decided that they will allow you to place your NFT as your profile picture. So what we talked about before, so once you mint your NFT, you make your, your NFT post, um, that is on the blockchain. And so if you were to be in a metaverse show, like with your artwork, like in a gallery, or you wanted to show your NFT as your profile pic, they're pulling that in via a URL. You're not assigning a different JPEG to it. They're actually referencing your NFT that is minted on the blockchain and pulling that image in to your profile picture space. Um, one, of the, one of the controversies right now or disappointments is, is that what I've read is it allows you to put any NFT in your profile picture, whereas the NFT community is kind of like, no, that's not how it's supposed to work. You're supposed to only be able to put your NFTs into your profile picture. So this was like a first step and uh, that's where it's at right now. And I think you also have to uh, upgrade to Twitter Blue. So that's a couple dollars a month charge to use this service. That's probably worth it, by the way, at two bucks, you get to upload videos that are like up to 10 minutes all of a sudden. I wow. mean, that that is worth it at two bucks a month. And I have to commend Twitter for making that only $2 a month, by the way, because that's a very, I mean, I mean, even at five bucks, you're already like, some people just can't a whole other tier of people can't do that. Five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month. That's like the going rate for like everything. Everything's 10 bucks a month. So two bucks seems reasonable. And now how did you engage with the NFT Twitter or community in general at first as you're kind of uh, dipping your toes in? Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did I first engage? Uh, really just you know, comment like on post is the way it starts. And then just having, you know, conversations with people in private messages. But something you did say about like the pricing on Twitter, and I wanted to go back to um, the point on, on Tezos is that um, one of the great things about Tezos, it is really a global and international artist community. And part of the reason is, is because the fees are so low, it's accessible to uh, a lot of different socioeconomic uh, strata. So you've got a real diverse group of people there, people that wouldn't necessarily be able to mint on Ethereum. So, I mean, I've heard people say, hey, that would be my entire month's paycheck to mint one NFT on Ethereum, whereas you can do that on, on Tezos. And so it is a more diverse community happening there. Why cross-chain? Why multiple chains? Yeah, yeah. It took me a while to get there. So, because um, I left Tezos and I went, you know, I pretty much dove into Ethereum and I thought, this is my place. This is where I'm, I'm going to be. I'm going to be an Ethereum artist. And what I've even just discovered in the last month, um, you just, it, you cannot predict what is going to happen in this space tomorrow. 
you know, it is not only are like the crypto markets volatile, but I'm starting to really appreciate the fact that NFTs are volatile. The NFT marketplace, all of it is volatile. Um, and so for me, that means not like saying, okay, I'm going to like commit and get, you know, fully commit to this one blockchain. I'm never going to mint anywhere else because as we see, like the Ethereum prices, like they're not coming, the gas prices, they're not coming down. You know, we've been told that they're going to come down, that uh, Ethereum 2 is coming, that, you know, different up updates are going to fix this problem and the problem's not being fixed. Um, and then that said, so, you know, one of the block, the blockchain that I'll be moving to, I'm, I'm going to start minting this week on Solana. And the thing with Solana is the, the amount of gas, like the energy consumption. So if you're looking at like sustainability and, you know, you're environmentally aware of, about what's going on on our planet, the amount of energy that it uses to complete one Solana transaction is one out of 100,000. So it's like significantly, significantly less than what you're expending with Ethereum. So I think what's emerging and what's happening is, is that the different blockchains um, are gonna have different points of value. And, you know, um, so Ethereum, yes, they're the big player, they're established, they will probably always be there, but you're going to have these Ethereum killers, these different blockchains popping up that are offering you less gas, that are offering you, or less lower gas fees, that are offering you, um, you know, more sustainable, energy-friendly options. And so all of these things, and then again, like I said, the international community, is it accessible? Um, we have things that are starting to emerge that are like, well, which marketplaces, which metaverses are going to be accessible to people that are disabled or hearing impaired or vision impaired? So these different blockchains are going to cater to different needs. And I think that is really what's going to make, you know, the, the cross chain um, absolutely necessary. Any other comments on the NFT space in general as it exists today or has evolved over the last, I guess, what, year or so? I mean, I think like what's really been going through my mind in terms of, of NFTs is that this is just, I mean, you hear it all the time and it almost seems cliche at this point, but like, this is just the beginning, but it, it really is. And, um, you know, kind of staying focused on that and, and recognizing that, you know, a lot of these systems like are still even in what I would consider like a beta mode. And some of them are, are literally in a beta mode. Um, and so there's a lot of like clunkiness. There can be some like barrier to entry, especially when you start explaining to people, oh, when you set up your first, you know, I said I set up a rainbow wallet. Well, that was not a good move. Like MetaMask is the, the, the primary wallet that you want to use. And so even when you start explaining to somebody, you're going to have these, you know, seed phrases and passwords, you need to store them, like, oh, don't, you might get hacked. Like you start explaining this when you're onboarding people, they're like, wait a second, you've got gas fees, you've got security issues, like, well, like, why do I want to do this? And so I think like my message is, is like, we're early, it is beta, <laughs> you know, it's not perfect, it's not ideal, but, you know, and with that comes like frustration, discouragement, and then like the need to be able to pivot. So like I said, you know, I just over the last month, I realized like I need to pivot onto another blockchain. And so just being able to be nimble, not like, you know, uh, not completely like uh, firmly committed or like rooted in like one marketplace or one approach because the landscape is just changing. You just never know what corporation or what government is going to make an announcement that's going to affect it one way or the other. And you just don't know. So Ethereum, Tezos, have there been any other blockchains that you've experimented with? Um, no, I've done a lot of research onto the Solana blockchain. I've set up my profiles. I have some wallets uh, ready for that. And my first mint is coming. But to this point, it's Tezos and Ethereum. What are you learning about Sol NFTs in the Solana blockchain? Yeah, so as we talked, there's different feelings to the different communities, and um, I've spoken with some people that are really into the Solana community, and it's uh, it's described as you know a new a new uh, young audience. So um, I think they're young, they're fun loving, and uh, maybe not uh, maybe not exposed to some of um, 
some of the more sophisticated or traditional uh, arts. And so uh, I'm a part of a group of abstract artists and we are coming to Solana and being like, okay, so maybe this isn't your usual fare, but we're gonna make our home here. And uh, what do you think about our art? So there's, there's definitely, um, I feel like some, there's an openness there and an invitation there um, and curiosity from the community. Let's talk about the pieces themselves, starting with like your journey as an artist. So when did you begin creating art and what's your relationship been with art over the years and who are your favorite artists? Okay, so I don't know if I'll remember all those questions, but I'll start with uh, art. So I started with art just, I mean, really young. I was a, a person that uh, knew they were a creator from a, an early age. It just resonated with me. I've studied like so many different art forms over the years. Um, for a time period, I was a silversmith and a, a jeweler, and that's how I made my living. And I studied printmaking in college. Um, so I have a degree as a printmaker, a bachelor's of fine art as a printmaker. I've also spent a, quite a bit of time uh, studying graphic design. And so all of this uh, kind of comes together. And I had not ever really been a painter um, as I mentioned, I've done a number of different uh, mediums. And so I really found painting, I, uh, watercolor specifically. I was living in Arizona in a uh, off the grid situation. So it was a small, small situation, uh, arid because it, you know we're in Arizona and I didn't have a lot of space or a big studio anymore because I'd graduated from college, no more you know big printmaking studio, no more big jewelry studio. So I was working with limited space and I thought, wow, well, what am I, what am I gonna do? And um, just decided to try some watercolors. And that's really how I got started on that. And so I was a watercolor artist there for exclusively for maybe almost a decade before I, um, I had a friend who left a box of art supplies behind. I was living in Santa Fe at the time and he was going back to Texas and he's like, I can't take this with me. And he just left this gigantic box of art supplies that I looked in it after he'd gone and I just stuff I'd never used before. I was like, well, I don't need any of this. I'm a watercolor artist. But, you know, I started looking through it and I said, well, what if I use this? What if I did that? And, you know, it's amazing how a small act like that really just impacted my artistic voice. Um, from there, I, you know, mix, I would consider myself a mixed media artist now using graphites and pens and um, you know, just making marks across the paper and it's become very expressive. Um, for me, it's a very expressive art form, but particularly using, like I said, the pencils and the charcoals. Who are some of your favorite artists? Oh, some of my favorite artists. Um, uh, well, I recently was reading up on Cindy Sherman. So I have a, uh, uh, a, a collection, which is a self-portraits of myself and uh, it's all digital. And that's called Le Femme Punk on OpenSea. And that is uh, directly inspired by uh, Cindy Sherman's self-portrait work. Um, I'm also a Cy Twombly fan. So I've uh, been a fan for a long time. I uh, grew up in Philadelphia for a period and uh, remember seeing his work. I believe it was the Philadelphia Museum of Art where I, I was with seeing his work. Um, I think those are, those are the top two that are coming to my mind at the moment. So let's take it, let's take a walk through the art that you're offering now on OpenSea in particular. So like digital cultivars, what mm -hmm. is that and what inspired it? Sure. Yeah, that was my, uh, that was my first, uh, that was my first collection on Ethereum, um, on OpenSea on Ethereum. And that, I mean, it was inspired. So like I came I came to the NFT Twitter and the work that I had already minted was my paintings. I put them online. And then I, I was like, whoa, everybody's doing like digital work and there's like 3D and there's augmented reality. And I just like kind of had my, my mind blown um, just seeing all the different art forms. And so I just, I decided that I wanted to try something. So I started uh, manipulating photographs and did a few, a little bit of research and a few tutorials on how to, to glitch things and uh, started, started like that. 
Um, that particular series is inspired uh, by strains of cannabis. And so it really plays all the, all the names of the artwork is based on cannabis strains. And I want it to kind of be like you're shopping in a dispensary when you're looking for your digital cultivar that you want to collect. What parallels, what opportunities are you seeing for like the cannabis space and NFTs? Hmm, I haven't given that too much thought lately. I think when I first got into the space, I thought, yeah, you know, this is definitely going to intersect, but I don't really, I haven't seen like a huge intersection of like the communities other than the NFT community are super pro cannabis. So, um, but so certainly seems like there should be some opportunities there, but I think what you're dealing with is, you know, there's still so much regulation, at least in the United States on the, you know, the federal and the state levels that uh, it's probably feels like a pretty sticky, sticky situation for investors to uh, get into. Yes. Cannabis is often sticky. So <laughs> It's actually illegal federally. So I had somebody uh, speaking to me who I work pretty closely with. Uh, his name's Jason Harris at Jerome Baker Designs. They were really popular in the 90s for creating bongs. And then in 2003, he was arrested in Operation Pipe Dreams. I work with Jason. And Tommy Chong was arrested in Operation Pipe Dreams. That was the clever name the feds gave the operation. And Tommy Chong went to jail for a year. Jason got house arrest for a year. And it was because he was sending bongs across state lines. And uh, so the feds came uh, and local police came and the postal service police came and knocked on his door and uh, tog tied him and his wife at the time, or girlfriend. And, um, and yes, so he says that the laws are exactly like they were back then federally. And he accepts that he could see the, that same fate once more befall him. And then he does, however, operate in Las Vegas, where he was able to get a license to manufacture pipes and bongs, which he says is a kind gesture from Las Vegas authorities. He also went to Las Vegas because he was like, I'm maybe low on the totem pool here based on what else is going on. So now let's move on from digital cultivars and take a look at Les Femmes Punks. What, is, what was the inspiration behind Les Femmes Punks and what do people need to know about it? Yeah, this is a great, uh, great inspiration story. So that really, so I, the digital cultivars was kind of like my first response, like, okay, what can I make really quick and just start? Um, and then uh, my punks, those kind of really kind of came out of like, okay, so I'm in this space. Like I just learned about like crypto punks. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand PFPs. I was like all new to NFTs. And it's just like, you get into NFT Twitter. And like I said, there's all these different mediums going on, all these like the metaverse and like your mind is just going like, <laughs> and, uh, and so this was my artistic response to like, okay, so identity projects, profile pictures, um, like, and I'm also coming off of a period of like, um, I had a period of like memory loss. So I had some illness that has, has happened in my life and there was a real period of, of memory loss. And so I'm bringing that like into this space where people are like looking at their identities, they're being anonymous, you know, they're using um, cartoon characters as their profile pictures. And I'm like, you know, and I'm trying to regain my memories of like who I was. And so I'm in this dialogue with myself of like, well, you know, how much of your identity is driven by memory, right? Like if you lose your memories and you can't remember, you know, just like, if you just don't remember, if you're not, if you just lose your memories and you're like, well, who am I? Like what, you know, and I'm coming back from an illness and I'm like, well, I can really just start to architect myself and, you know, create like who I am and what's important to me and, you know, start to cultivate those things as I'm, you know, rebuilding after an illness. And then I'm also like intersecting now with the NFT community and I'm like, wow, they're like engaged in the same kind of dialogue of like, who am I? Like, what is identity? Like, is it important? And so it was kind of taking, drawing from like those two angles of like, you know, how important is memory to identity? How flexible is your identity? And, um, and then also like adding in like that new medium, like I mentioned of like, of glitching. And so it all came together into my femme punks. 
which I plan to keep doing. So I plan to continue this series for quite a, a, for a long time. Um, I, this one feels like really personal to me. Like I said, it's really an introspection and like a lot of my, um, like a lot of my drawings and stuff are real expressive. Like you'll see like the motion and, you know, it, uh, it can evoke emotion, but the punks for me are really like an internal exploration in some ways and they hold a lot of potency. And so I can, I plan to continue to release them um, for quite a, quite a long time to come as a record of where I started, who I was, who I've become, how I've transformed. So moving on, you have bad bunnies as well. Can you tell mm -hmm. us about that? Yeah, uh, Bad Bunnies was another response to the NFT community. Um, this is starting to be a theme here, but um, for me, artistic dialogue with an audience is one of the biggest influences in my work, because that's what it's about for me. If you're just creating like in a void for yourself, I don't think that you're really achieving like your full potential. Like for me, it's about talking, engaging and saying, okay, oh, I hear what you know, I hear what's important to you, or I hear what interests you. And then like internalizing that and being like, well, this is my response on paper. And so uh, that's what Bad Bunnies was. It, for me, it draws on the influence of street art, um, graffiti art. So I'm not a street artist or a graffiti artist, but I appreciate the style. And so it incorporates that type of, um, those types of line work, that type of line work, um, just kind of evokes that, that feeling. And um, so yeah, so just trying to, you know, be cool and kind of hip and fit in the space and utilize um, utilize and grow upon like work that I had already been doing. So it was like the next, the next evolution of my mixed media work when I got with the Bad Bunnies. Tell us more about uh, your artwork specifically and how it relates to NFTs. So we've spoken today so far about digital cultivars, punks, bad band bunnies. And actually, I guess before that, we need to talk about landscapes. Actually, no, <laughs> I think I'm, I think I'm confused now. Oh, you know what? I, you know, before we move on, I want to talk about foundation.app. So um, your, so digital cultivars and punks are available on OpenSea, And then you link to foundation.app for, for bad bunnies. Why? And what is foundation app? Yep. And there's also my flowers in there as well. And so um, the foundation app is another marketplace. It's another Ethereum marketplace. You would use your wallet. So your MetaMask ideally to connect with it, connect your funds in there and you can um, shop for artwork. It's just another NFT marketplace. The difference with foundation from OpenSea is that it's auction only. So you can't put a buy now price on things. It has a unique way of kicking off the auction. So the way it works is uh, you mint your work, you list your work with reserve price. So you might say the least amount I'll accept for this NFT is 0.1 ETH. Um, you announce it to your friends on Twitter or wherever you're, you can let, announce on LinkedIn now too. So, but you basically announce to your audience, hey, I've got this up for auction and it could sit there for a while or somebody could jump on it right away. But as soon as somebody makes the first bid, it kicks off a 24 hour auction. So from that point in 24 hours, the auction is gonna close and there's 24 hours for additional, um, additional bidders to make their bid. How's that been for you using foundation.app compared to OpenSea? Yeah, um, well, so I struggled selling my uh, traditional mixed media work on paper on OpenSea. I had some, I tried it there and I didn't get a lot of response. And so I thought, well, somebody gave me a foundation invite and I thought, okay, I'll try it. And I did. Um, and I immediately within 24 hours, I had my first bid. So that was like a, an immediate win for me. And so along with that, so we've mentioned like minting fees, listing fees, but when you, when you're, when you get a bid and your auction closes, you then, uh, pay fees to settle your auction. And so for an artist, when the fees were not that high, it wasn't that big of a deal. But as the fees get higher and higher, the gas fees um, based on, you know, the Ethereum congestion, like the price to do an auction can, can be quite significant. And so personally, that is like one of the huge benefits of OpenSea. You just don't have to deal with that on the same uh, opposite token. Like 
um, you know, these different marketplaces have different audiences that are interested in different things. So it's really about finding where your audience is in the moment, because it's also, like I said, rapidly changing the environment, the landscape is changing um, as fast as you can even get your eyes on it. So um, like I said, I'm getting ready to uh, give a go at some Solana marketplaces and see where, where that takes me. Um, yeah, because the gas prices are just making it like, well, I don't really want to use this. It's so expensive. And then landscapes. Can you tell us about landscapes, which is one of your NFT collections? Uh -huh. Yep, for sure. So that collection is on, on Maker's Place. That's another uh, Ethereum marketplace. And the landscapes, this was also, um, or, I mean, all, all of my art is personal. I think that's just par for the course. But this one, this, this series was created in a numerous different, like physical locations. So I've lived in a lot of different places throughout the United States and have also traveled extensively throughout the United States. And so um, during that, and even internationally, and during that time, I've carried my, you know, my paper, my watercolor tablet with me and my mixed media tools. And I have created these uh, landscapes in different places and uh, some of them actually like more than one place. So there's some, some works on there that like I started in, maybe in Virginia and then like finished in Arizona. And so it's not like a literal, like I looked out my winds, window landscape, like I, it's not a plain air painting where I stood there and copied it. Um, it, it is, it is uh, the colors and the lines come together to make an abstract composition, which reminds me, it's like drawn on my memories. It reminds me of places that I've been, but not in a literal way. And particularly if I'm talking about one that's uh, been created in, in, you know, multiple places. It's like drawing on elements of all those places. How do they meld? And uh, it feels like a memory to me. And then can you speak more to Maker's Place, especially versus Foundation.app or also OpenSea? Sure, sure, sure. So Maker's Place just made an announcement today also that they have rolled out an easier minting process. So I would say that's like one of the big things that artists pay, pay attention to is, is the minting process. So I haven't tried the new process, but it's supposed to be simpler. Um, because uh, one of the things with gas is you can pay a higher gas fee to make sure your transaction completes. And sometimes if you just pay the base fee, your transaction doesn't ever complete. So that's one of the things with Maker's Place that you were being required always to, to adjust your gas prices in order to make sure your mint was complete. And that can be kind of cumbersome, particularly for new users. So um, as I mentioned, I think they've corrected that problem. Um, and so, you know, I can't really speak to it, but aside from that, it's, it's very similar. I think you can do, yeah, you can do buy now or auction. So you have a little bit more flexibility and it's a different, it's a different audience. So, um, you can also do additions on there. So multiple copies of the same piece that would go to different collectors. So again, just a different audience, different group of people. Any comments on your work, either those which are available now or perhaps forthcoming work that people should know about? Yeah, so, so the digital cultivars, so I'm pretty excited. I recently, just this last week, uh, dropped four pieces in there. So they're one of one, so it means there's only one piece available, um, as opposed to some of the other um, artworks in that collection where there's multiple copies and editions. Um, so yeah, so I'm really super excited about that. I, like, like I said, I, it's a dialogue for me, like seeing what other people are doing, hearing what my audience has to say. And so this is, you know, what I've come back with after doing, you know, my first version of digital cultivars. So for me, it represents um, a higher level of technical skill. Um, and I, I worked really hard to achieve that. Um, and, and I'm excited because this series is called, uh, is called Wonderland and uh, just really play, playing off the different dispensary names. So uh, definitely take, out, take a look at Wonderland, which is in the Digital Cultivars collection on OpenSea. And um, Fempunks, yep, I've got another one of those coming up soon, slowly releasing those. And what I'm most excited about is uh, Solana. So I have just set up my profile on exchange.art. So that's coming up this week. Uh, we'll be making my first drop there. It's gonna be a continuation of the work that 
you can currently see on foundation. It's going to be uh, mixed media work on paper. Um, yeah, so definitely check out my new my new collections on exchange.art and I'll be putting those links up uh, this week. Have you thought at all about digital artwork and what definitely. is digital? Okay, so so what is digital and like how are you thinking about incorporating it into your I guess uh, what do we what do we call this? I mean, what do you call like regular artwork if you're an artist who's selling paintings in a museum, it's your um physical your, your physical. work? I know, but like traditional, traditional art, your paintings. So you can refer to them as different mediums. So, but physical usually. So like, even when you're, so like, even when I'm using like mixed media on paper and I'm not including the physical piece with the NFT, you still call it a physical. It's a little bit confusing. It kind of needs kind of, so I refer to it as physical or traditional art. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I'm aware of fidgetals. I think the idea is really compelling. And I have considered, um, I have considered it, I've considered ways, uh, as far as like paintings, like I do offer the physical painting. Like if you meet a certain threshold as a collector, you're able to say, hey, send, ship me the painting. So I include that as a perk for my collectors. Uh, but I wouldn't really consider that to be the, like, what I would think of like when I think about fidgetals. So a lot of times like with fidgetals, you're thinking about like, okay, so I'm gonna sell an NFT of a sweatshirt that my avatar can wear. And then in real life, I'm also gonna have that same sweatshirt to wear. So that's like the real meaning behind fidgetal. And yes, I've definitely given it some thought. And like I said, I don't really feel like it intersects like with paintings that well, but you know, keep my head wrapped around it. I am a world of women. Holder. So I do have my own world of women and I've considered, uh, you know, doing, doing some physical jewelry based on, based on that character. Um, but I don't have any concrete plans to release any fidgetals. What is the challenge to move into the fidgetal world with paintings? Well, I mean, I think just in general, the challenge to move into the digital world is you know, technical. So you need some level of skills on how to uh, work with augmented reality. Um, uh, I guess that's not necessary, but like in a lot of the situations, that's that's definitely being implemented. Um, or if you're making uh, wearables for the metaverse, you need those technical skills. So, uh, and that a lot of times depends like what metaverse are you gonna be building on and then learning those specific skills for creating wearables on that metaverse. So I think it comes down to in some ways, you know, having to commit to like where you're going so that you can um, expand your knowledge. So, I know we talked before about like not committing too strongly to one thing, but in some ways, like I think in this, like I haven't moved into it because like I don't want to commit into, you know, putting this much energy into learning this specific specific uh, skill, especially because things are changing so rapidly. And like, well, what if I learn this, and then tomorrow that's no longer applicable? So for me, I'm not in a position to learn um, those technical skills that quickly and that rapidly to kind of keep up. <laughs> The metaverse. What in the world is the metaverse? And you mentioned it earlier. Um, and there's a lot of parallels between, or even uh, kind of a mutual um, inclusivity, if you will, between NFTs and, and the metaverse. So, any comments on the metaverse? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, I've been super excited to be a part of the metaverse and to just like just know what it is to have been there to have shows there um it's been it's been awesome for me to experience the metaverse and to to learn about it um absolutely so uh first off like going to decentraland so my first shows were in decentraland and that was uh that's a lot of fun then my next shows were in crypto voxels and just this past month i've had two different shows in crypto voxels um that which is uh, a metaverse a gaming platform in the metaverse and so uh, Crypto Voxel, so one of my favorite galleries there is called I'm Not Art, and they're based out of Chicago. So they have a physical gallery in Chicago, and then they also have a digital metaverse gallery in Crypto Voxels. And what's great about that is that it actually uh, mirrors the, um, the one in the metaverse actually mirrors precisely the architecture of the one in Chicago in real life. So 
the same artwork will be displayed in the physical gallery um, as the same artwork will be displayed um, in the metaverse. And so I find that to be just really, uh, really fascinating use of space and use of the metaverse and ability to like connect in with a community and a group um, across like, you know, globally. And it, what's actually really fun is in these metaverse events, you have people waking up like in the middle of the night and in, in another country on the other side of the globe to meet with you. Um, and it's, it's, it's really, it's a lot of fun. I think the other part about the metaverse is if you're not a gamer and you're not used to using like a gaming, gaming console um, or navigating an avatar, like that can really be a challenge uh, to people that are trying it for the first time. Um, I have a friend who has an art show coming up this weekend and she just, you know, pinged me and she said, Hey, how did you learn to move your avatar? Like I got into the show, but like, I don't know how to move around the space. And I had the opportunity to recount, um, the first time that I had gone to a metaverse show and it was in spatial, which I have never been to since then, but I was at a show in spatial and I got there and I was like, I just, I couldn't even, I couldn't find anybody. I don't even think I found all the artwork. So I would say that if you're not used to gaming, um, give it a, you know, give it a few, a few tries to kind of get your metaverse chops on and learn how to navigate your avatar around. And for me, like the best way um, as an artist, like I keep track of shows that I like to go to. There's another gallery in Decentraland called Boneyard. And I've been to a lot of their shows and just kind of, you know, they always have great, a uh, great lineup of artists. It's like three floors or more. And, and a lot of, a lot of them also incorporate some sort of um, like parquet course where like an obstacle course. So uh, you might have to walk up like a narrow ramp to see, you know, the second floor of art or something like that. And so it, it's definitely worthwhile learning to navigate your avatar in crypto voxels, like one of my favorite things is um, people get together for to dance. So you can also stream like your DJ from YouTube right into your event. Um, you can have an art art event with music, you know, DJ streaming, and then you invite people, and you just your avatar has the option to dance, and you see your little avatar just moving around the space, and other people are doing that. You can. Um, make expressions with emojis, which kind of just flood the air. And if everybody is doing that all at once, it can be quite festive. Uh, I personally uh, have been uh, more or less homebound for a few years, even before COVID uh, due to my illness. And so it's been a really great way for me to connect with other people um, in my life, like that I can't see face to face. So we meet in the metaverse and I haven't been dancing in so long. And so it's, it's, a lot of fun. So it might sound lame to some people, but I like to dance in the metaverse. How uh, for how do you get into the metaverse? Can you take walk somebody through that? Sure. Yeah, it used to be a lot more complicated. Like back to this like beta space. Every time you go to answer a question is different. Um, so you used to have to have a wallet, like a MetaMask wallet, um, like I mentioned, to get into the metaverse. Um, sorry, to get into Decentraland, which is one place in the metaverse. Um, and so, but now they've changed it so you can get in as a guest. So you literally go to the Decentraland URL, which I'm sorry, I don't know exactly what that is, um, but it's Decentraland dot something. Um, and so you basically just go to that URL and uh, you hit guest. And next thing that happens is you'll be given instructions to dress your avatar, uh, actually pick your avatar. So you can choose your hair color, hair length, your eye color, um, you know, body type. Um, and then you pick your clothes, you know, shirt, pants, shoes, jewelry, glasses you're going to wear. So you basically dress your avatar and then you hit OK and you get um, you get entered into the game. So the game will take uh, a minute to load and it loads all the scenes. And next thing you know, you'll be standing there and it will look like um, it will look like a scene in front of you. So there might be grass and trees and a building, you know, light posts. And you just start to use your uh, cursor or your mouse, your trackpad, whatever you're using, your arrows to start to navigate your avatar through the space. So how do you then have a, uh, a show in metaverse? Yeah, so the show in the metaverse, um, 
so you have a, a specific URL, basically. So the different galleries and the different points um, will have a specific URL that points to, to a specific location. So the um, one of my favorite galleries in crypto voxels, they have a unique URL, um, so that, which is pointed right into their space, cryptobox.space. And if you go there, you go straight to their gallery. Um, a lot of the URLs are a lot more complicated and show the coordinates. And um, so you basically just paste that into your browser though, and you can join an event and there will be other people there at the same time who are also joining the, you know, the same location. And they could have navigated there through the game. Um, but it's just using the URL as a shortcut to get to the gallery space where you're meeting people. And then, um, yes, yeah, so in terms of like speaking or communicating with one another, um, you might have, like I said, you might have the music playing, uh, streaming from YouTube into the space. But if you really want to communicate, the best way to do it is um, off, like outside of the game. So um, that means like if it's a, a gallery event, a lot of times there'll be a Twitter spaces being held in conjunction. So you're on the metaverse with your, you know, computer on Decentraland or crypto voxels, and then you're also on Twitter with the Twitter spaces open and people are communicating uh, with voice over the Twitter spaces um, while interacting in the metaverse with avatars. As a collector, what excites you about NFTs? Because I know you not only create your own NFT, NFTs, you're not only an NFT artist, but you also collect. So what excites you from the collector's point of view? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I have a different, like, even from that point of view, I have two different aspects. So like, I like to collect uh, one of one artwork and I've collected a few editions as well. Um, I particularly like to support uh I particularly like to support women artists um, and I also support abstract artists. So, and if you're a woman abstract artist, it's probably a guarantee I'm looking at your work. Um, and that's, that's more of a passion of mine um, as opposed to like a money-making endeavor. So I'm not saying that you can't flip some of these NFTs. I've definitely collected some one-of-ones from artists who have flipped 10 times, you know, the price that I've paid for them. So it's definitely a financial opportunity. Um, however, I actually collect the artwork because I like it and because I want to support the artists. And so far, I actually haven't um, decided to, 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 to list any of the NFTs uh, that I've collected from individual artists um, on Ethereum. So I have on Tezos, it's a little different. I've done quite a bit of collecting on Tezos and like, and there's events there where you can collect for like pennies, like you can collect NFTs. I think, I think one time I collected like almost a hundred NFTs for like $5. So that's a lot of fun to do. And you can really just grab anything that, that gets your interest. And those ones I have uh, put up for sale, but haven't had any real successful flips on those because there's some that I'm holding, like there's one, one that I, I'm holding by Kate Kirst which I bought for probably about 15 Tezos, might've been 20. And I think the list price on that now is 600 or 700 Tezos because she's become quite popular um, a Ethereum artist as well. So that's like a, a pretty significant increase in value. Um, but I tend to be a, a, a hodler or a holder. So I just, I just wanna keep these uh, because I, I don't know what's coming next, but I'd like to have, have these NFTs in my bag for the future and just kind of, you know, banking on what's coming next. And then I also, I also collected a world of women and I'm pretty excited about the financial return on that. That was a financially motivated decision. I took some of the Ethereum that I'd earned from selling artwork. And I decided um, after doing like a lot of careful consideration to, to invest that in world of women. And the reason is, is because I could see um, just there were so many different aspects um, to that community, which uh, indicated to me that it was it was a winner. It was a, a, a solid bet. Um, I'm not interested, like one of the strategies for collectors is to buy a bunch of different projects and just see which one, you know, wins out and, and does, a, does a big return. I don't really have a lot of time for that in my life. And so I just picked World of Women. I said, I feel really confident about this. This is going to be a winner. And since the time that I purchased it. I think the floor price has gone up four times. So I feel pretty good about that as well. So, and I intend to hold it until it goes to a hundred ETH. How can others pick winners? What do you suggest? How do people go about finding NFTs? 
Yeah, so it's a, it's the same, like you could say the same for artists as collectors, like there's no one single approach that is going to get you a winner. And like I said, there, um, one approach is to invest in a lot of different projects, you know, off the bat when they're at a low, a low price point, and hope that, you know, you picked a winner. Um, it's not a strategy that I use. I, I'm, I'm looking for, um, well, so I think Fame Lady Squads, World of Women, and then there was like another one like that all dropped at the same time. And I watched for months, months and months and months um, before I finally made a determination as to which one um, was going to move. So looking at the activity, looking at, um, so I'm also, I also have um, money in different cryptos and different altcoins. And so I'm accustomed to watching the cryptocurrencies and watching the crypto markets and how they, they operate. And you can start to understand when your, your market has bottomed out and when you know, you're approaching a, an all-time high or a top. And um, so you start to get familiar with that. And so basically on OpenSea, you can look at your, your charts the same way there on an NFT project as to you know, where the floor is, what the activity has been, and, um, and, and, you know, and make a speculation as to where it's going. And so I felt really good about what I was seeing on World of Women. And I actually, I mean, one of the biggest influences was, as I'd heard about NFT NYC, and I was like, wow, they're having parties where if you want to get into the party, you have to own the NFT. And I was like, how much more awesome would it be to be in a party with, you know, the World of Women holders? And, and then also seeing the price and saying, okay, I am speculating that this is going to skyrocket pretty soon. And this is probably my last opportunity to afford a world of women because then I'll just be completely outpriced, right? So I kind of got in under the wire on that for myself and uh, pretty excited about it. And of course, you know, seeing in the news, the different athletes, the different celebrities, you're like, okay, if Serena Williams is doing it, I should probably maybe, this is probably a good deal. Well, I think that's all the questions I have. This was fascinating. Thank you so much, Mel. We've been we've had the honor of sitting down today with Mel Shapcott, whose work you can find at Mel, I believe it's melshapcott.com, correct? Uh, yep, or melshapcott.art, either one. And that's your link tree at melshapcott.art. And then also you're on Twitter at Mel Shapcott, where you're very active. Thank you so much, Mel, for taking your time today to speak to us about NFTs and, and all of your NFT work. Absolutely. My pleasure. I'm so glad we crossed paths on LinkedIn and super, super excited and super glad you had me here. So this has been great. Likewise. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for listening.